And there we go. I already started it. So, Dr. Heller, how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. I think I hit every piece of construction on the way back from Golden because I work at the um, at the national lab up there, and I'm a oh. R and D engineer. Uh -huh. So, yeah, for building technologies like HVAC cooling, things like that, I manage. I help manage those projects for the most part. Um, yeah, I don't. My job's not as exciting as yours is. <laughs> so that sounds pretty exciting. And I think I think everything has kind of its like time and time and place where it is exciting. This is a time of year where everything's getting like submitted. We manage all those like all that funding from the federal government, and then we kind of just put it over the fence of FA and let it go. We just kind of <laughs> let it go, and we go. Okay, I hope nothing's wrong. If something's wrong, it's not a problem anymore. <laughs> okay. But yeah, if you. Introduce yourself to everybody, kind of say what it is you do, your background, all of that stuff, history, just, just have at it. Sure. Well, I'm Craig Heller. I'm a professor of biology at Stanford. Um, I taught physiology and neurobiology here for many, many, many years. Uh, and uh, I have research in several different areas. Part of my research is on the neurobiology of sleep and circadian rhythms, uh, and specifically, the role of sleep and circadian rhythms in learning and memory. Uh, right now, I'm actually starting a uh, joint project with a number of colleagues across the country to uh, create a white paper on the problems associated with student athlete travel, uh, which I think is being ignored. Uh, so my work with athletes is totally different, uh, although I'm concerned about their sleep and their rhythms, uh, but I'm interested in thermal physiology of how temperature influences performance. And what we've done is we've developed, invented a technology which can get heat in or out of the body very quickly. And what we found with that is that a major cause of muscle fatigue or muscle failure, you know, when you just can't do one more rep, uh, it's largely due to a rise in temperature of the muscle. If we take that heat out, the muscle just keeps on working. And if you have that benefit, you can extend your work volume. And as a result, you get big conditioning effects. So uh, we're doing a lot of work with uh, students and athletes and professional athletes and uh, others, uh, including firefighters, uh, with respect to the effect of temperature on their performance. That's a, a mouthful and a lot. And <laughs> I know doing CrossFit and like having that kind of background is recovery is like the key to to being good at any sport. If you can recover faster, you can do, you know, way more work. Your work capacity goes up high. And I remember being in college and traveling from place to place from Greensboro to Arkansas to California, back to Memphis and, you know, getting that jet lag, it sucked. Yeah, and really especially go, yeah. yeah and especially going from like low altitude to high altitude because i grew up in the mississippi river delta of of, <laughs> uh, of memphis tennessee and they were 200 feet below sea level and now i live at 6700 feet up and <laughs> that is a night and day difference especially with like oxygen and taking all that stuff but how i got to meet dr heller was through um through another Craig <laughs> um, that works for Cool Mitt. And I reached out to him because one of my buddies that we had on the podcast, um, Dex Hopkins said that, yeah, I got this new thing called Cool Mitt and this thing is amazing. You, you don't even know how, how awesome it is until you try it. So I reached out and told him my background in the military, you know, having all those hot summers of being an NTC namely and being like, okay, if we could just cool everybody down, life would be so much easier because I think our last NTC, NTC rotation, we lost 45% uh, of our brigade to heat casualties. And I was one of them. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. I went into rhabdo and my core temperature got up to 102 and I was at Ooh. 102 for a hot minute. And we had uh, one guy get medevaced out. He was like 104. They sent him straight to Las Vegas. It was like, Hey, I'm going to send him to the hospital. He's going to go brain dead. So luckily he's fine now, but this little device that they have, I have it in the garage in my home, in my home gym back here, but that thing is amazing. And how did, how did, how did you, how did that come to be? Like how, what, what made you kind of get stuck to that problem? I know how research kind of works and you come up with a, a, a question, you go, Hey, how can we make people perform better? And then you go, Oh, what about 
you know, cooling the body. What what cools the body? Blood. So how, how did you get to that point, Dr. Heller? Well, I, I think you've missed one important part about scientific <laughs> research, and that's serendipity. <laughs> <laughs> you have to keep your eyes open for what you didn't expect. And <laughs> frequently that leads to the most important and innovative discoveries. And in our case, uh, I always worked on how the brain regulates body temperature. So this is pretty straight neurophysiology and, and, uh, and animal physiology. And one day a colleague who is uh, an anesthesiologist uh, said to my colleague, who I have always worked with in this project, uh, well, you think you know so much about temperature regulation. I bet you couldn't solve a problem we have in the recovery room. Well, what's that? <laughs> Well, patients come into the recovery room, they're coming out of anesthesia and they're hypothermic and they shiver like crazy. And it may take us hours to get them to stop shivering. I said, ah, that's a trivial problem. No, <laughs> it is a very hard problem because what happens when you're coming out of anesthesia and you're hypothermic is you shut down your blood flow to the periphery. And when you do that, you can't get heat into the body. So it's like trying to heat someone over a fur coat. Uh, you just, the, the skin is a very good insulator. So my colleague Dennis got the idea of what if we put an arm or a leg in a negative pressure environment of vacuum and we heated that arm or that leg. The vacuum would pull blood into the limb. The blood would be heated and it would flow back into the body and warm from the inside out. So uh, he built a really crazy device, used the duct from a welding shop and uh, the sleeve from a wetsuit and a hospital warming pad. And we took this device over to the hospital. We couldn't do that now. <laughs> he sounds like an engineer. <laughs> but we took it over to the hospital and the first patient, the first patient, no shivering and back up to 37 degrees in eight minutes. And we couldn't believe it. We just couldn't believe it. You slapped that patent on there real quick. <laughs> it, it turned out, it turned out that it had nothing to do with the arm at all. It was only the hand. Ah, oh, glabular van, glabular glands. And then we then we looked into the old anatomical literature and we found that in our non-hairy skin like the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet, and the upper part of the face, we have special blood vessels. And these blood vessels shunt the blood from the arteries to the veins directly, bypassing the capillaries, which are the high resistance vessels. And when you are, when you shake someone's hand, you can tell them right away, you can tell right away what their thermal status is. I mean, the hand is hot or it's cold, or maybe in between. But if it's hot, they are at a high temperature and they're trying to lose heat. So what we realized, Kenya, is that we were dealing with a natural mammalian adaptation for heat loss. We were just using it in reverse. <laughs> so we then started looking at whether we could treat hyperthermia, high temperature, and we had, a, we had to have people hot in order to do those experiments. So our uh, lab assistant was a gym rat. Uh, he would go to the gym every day after work. <clears throat> so we asked him, well, why don't you do your workout here in the lab? And we'll use that as a way of getting you hot. And then we'll experiment with extracting that heat. Well, he liked to do pull-ups. So he would do yeah, 10 sets of pull-ups with three minute rests. So we would then have him do these 10 sets with three minute rests. And at the end, we would apply our prototype devices and settings and so forth. And one day for no reason at all, after we cooled him, he went back to the pull-up bar and did the same number of pull-ups as in his first set. And we said, holy crow. What does that mean? That means that it was the rise in temperature which caused the muscle fatigue. So we then started cooling him after every other set of pull-ups and his capacity, his work volume 
went up enormously. So here are the numbers. In the first six weeks, when we were just cooling him at the end of the set of pull-ups, he was got up to doing 180 pull-ups. Okay? That's egregious. That's crazy. Well, that's six weeks going to the gym twice a week, uh, and already he was, well, he was pretty fit. The next six weeks, when we cooled him after every other set of pull-ups, he went from 180 to 618. 618 gnarly behind the... Behind the neck pull-ups. <laughs> yeah. wow. that's, that's insane. Like, I, I think about how many athletes would benefit from just having that device. And I only did, se I essentially did seven one observations for anyone that doesn't know an observation is essentially just an event that occurs statistically in the, in, in, in nature. So I did 71 iterations of using this with different various workouts that went from anaerobic to aerobic ones that use, you know, long-term uh, fat usage, like long, long runs that were over like 45 minutes long. And I started getting the same pronounced effect every time I used it. And it was funny because the more I used it, the less time I needed to use it as, as I went on. And yeah. I think it was about the 50th observation that I went, oh, I only need to have this on about 47 seconds to a minute. And my my recovery heart rate is 122. And you can find that by Googling. There's a little equation you can do to figure out based on your age, body weight, um, uh, your ethnic background. And mine is 122. And I would get from 178 to 180 beats a minute down to 122, sometimes down below that quickly. And I could do that in an EMOM. I could use it, say the first EMOM was a, a 13 calorie row and I spike my heart rate to 156 stick my hand in there for the remaining 30 seconds I have and I got down to 123 124 sometimes down to 119 that fast and I moved to the next movement and feel like a brand new person like I had just started my workout <laughs> it was like really hard to believe at first I was like okay so you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna do all the same workouts without it the first week and then the second week I'm gonna do the same exact workouts Hopefully the ambient air temperature was the same and they were roughly the same, my plus and minus four or five degrees. And I got a better result than in those workouts the second week than I did the first week. It was kind of amazing. And <laughs> I don't know what, 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 what part does lactic acid kind of play in the body in doing these things? Is that a debunked myth or is that still hold to be true, Dr. Heller? That's pretty much a debunked myth. And okay. here is the, the, the easy evidence that uh, George Brooks over at UC Berkeley uh, infused lactate and found out that it did not cause fatigue. So it could artificially raise blood lactate uh, and it didn't cause fatigue. Now, what we're finding now is that in contrast, uh, uh, fatigue is not caused by lactate, but fatigue causes lactate increase. And oh. we think we know why, that the reason our cooling works to uh, restore muscle uh, activity is the muscle has a, a fail-safe device. It, uh, there is an enzyme that controls the final step of getting fuel into the mitochondria. And of course, it's the mitochondria that produce the ATP that we need to contract our muscles, okay? So this particular enzyme is temperature sensitive. So when you get into that danger zone, like you were mentioning rhabdomyolysis, that's a very severe condition. You get close to the danger zone of high tissue temperature, it shuts off. So there's no, it's like you're no longer putting fuel into the fire. Uh, and what happens is that uh, as a result of that, uh, you back up the pathway by which glucose is being converted to this, uh, this muscle fuel, uh, this muscle energy source, and uh, that results in a buildup of lactate. Oh, God. Uh, I, and, and how do you flush it? Is, there, is, that a, is that a myth too, flushing it? Is that a myth? Well, you know, actually lactate is a common coinage of energy exchange. So the lactate leaves as the muscle, it goes into the circulation, it goes back to the liver and gets converted to glucose. So you so, need it technically. 
Yeah, you're, you're actually using it as a fuel source, uh, but also it can diffuse into your gut and the microbiome can use it. Uh, and what the microbiome does is use it to produce free fatty acids and those can diffuse back into the body and be used as further fuel. So lactate is sort of a, a, an intermediate in all of these energy exchange pathways. That is pretty cool because we learned through like level one CrossFit kind of the energy cycles. And, you know, we we know that the first burst of energy you get for a minute and 30 seconds is just ATP. And we, we yeah. always tell yeah. people that come into their first workout, like, don't go very fast because everyone's a hero for the first 90 seconds. Yes. And then right. that two yeah. minutes hits and right. you hit a wall and they're like, well, what's happening? I'm like, to the best of my ability, I'm not a I'm not a biologist i'm not anywhere close to being where you are dr hill i'll explain to them i'll go hey you are making at you have atp and when you burn that you lose what is a lose a phosphate molecule and you have to gain it back to build more atp and how long does it take you to rebuild that atp back in your system because i know you go from that to burning carbs and fat as energy well essentially your basic fuel is glucose in the blood you know that and that glucose goes through a process in the cell called glycolysis. So you break down the glucose to produce pyruvate. And then pyruvate is the molecule that goes into the mitochondria and is used to make ATP. Okay. So if you want to shut the muscle off, shut off that last enzyme. And that's why you cannot do one more rep. Now, in the situation you're talking about, that first 90 seconds, yeah, you're using preformed ATP and creatinine phosphate, another high energy molecule. And then you eventually have to replace that. And then you go into aerobic activity. Uh, and aerobic activity is producing the, it's producing the ATP at the level you need. Uh, and if you exceed that uh, level, then you go anaerobic. And you don't want to be, <laughs> and so explain to everybody what anaerobic means. Well, if you go anaerobic, you are essentially just building up an oxygen debt. Uh, you're, you're, consuming, you're consuming energy at a higher rate then you can replenish it with oxidative metabolism, with oxidizing the fuel molecules that uh, are in the mitochondria. And then what you're doing is you're essentially going into uh, what's called the lactic acid debt. It's not really lactic acid, but it's lactate, uh, which is another form of the molecule. And that's when your blood lactate levels start rising. Jeez. So the lactate level is really a biomarker of fatigue. It's not causing fatigue. It's, it's an indication that you have run out of fuel or you've run out of the capacity uh, to make ATP. And does nutrition versus like working out and conditioning play a role in how early you get to that or? Well, yes, it does. Because uh, if you do a heavy, heavy workout, uh, you have to replace the energy stored in your muscle. And that energy is stored as glycogen. So glycogen is a starch, you know, just like potatoes are starch. Okay. So we normally have a pretty good supply of glycogen in our muscles and in our livers. Right. So what happens is that uh, if you have a heavy workout, you deplete your muscle glycogen. And it's not easy to replace. It takes time. So if you then do a heavy workout the next day, you're starting at a lower level of fuel, fuel reserve. If you now, so what's important is the rate at which you replenish this glycogen reserve. Okay? If you eat a high fat diet, that's very slow. If you eat a high carb diet, it's faster. So you're much more likely to be able to repeat the same level of activity day after day if you're on a high carb diet than if you're on a high fat diet. So all of these like keto, 
you know, diets would they, they wouldn't potentially help you in athleticism or would they? Uh, well, <laughs> the effect of the keto diet is essentially that it forces you to burn fat. So it's good for uh, getting rid of, uh, of too much body fat, but it actually is probably uh, going to slow you down in terms of recovery. Jeez, so like recovering from the next day. So if I were to have an athlete do, so as I say, I have an athlete going through a deload week right now. He's not lifting anything super heavy. He's like high reps, low weight volume. He's going through the week, you know, Friday, he tapers all the way down. Saturday has a really light day, maybe a run. And then he's going to max out next week. Is that a smart, logical way to go about this, about the training cycle or no? Yeah. I think in this situation, you know more than I do, <laughs> because this is based on on empirical evidence. It's what you find that works, mm -hmm. and what I find in uh, in athletics is that there is a strong propensity to continue what works, to repeat what has worked. Now that's good because it's a way of maximizing your experience, but also sometimes it can go against you because you're not willing to try something new. You're not willing to alter the re regime. And sometimes when you alter regime, you find, yeah, you can do a little better. Yeah, true. I, it's kind of like when you get a, it's kind of like the starting strength booklet. Everybody that does, you know, any type of training has read it or, you know, if they're kind of prescribed training, you've read it. You have like beginner, intermediate or not, well, beginner, novice or novice, beginner, intermediate. Then you have elite and you get the most gains from that beginner to intermediate stage. And then when you hit that elite stage, you need a different change in the stimulus rep amount of rest to get that next growth step to get a higher to hit a higher weight hit a new personal best or things like that and uh i don't know it's 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 kind of hard because it's like an art form you know we try to divide science and art into two different things and a lot of what you do and a lot of what i do and what steve does is an art form you know how much of what you do is is an art what exactly is it that i do that's an art it's crossfit man working out we solve problems every day and we're like, huh? I wasn't sure that that was the first thing I was going to say on joining this podcast today, but I didn't know that I do art. My attitude might be an art though. I mean, most scientific endeavors start from art. You go, man, I want to envision this thing over here or this result. You envision well, it. Yeah. Science is creative. And uh, I mean, so, that's how COVID happened, huh? Yeah. So you're essentially, uh, using your creative abilities when you design a new experiment or you ask a new question uh, or you design a new piece of equipment. And that's exactly what you're doing as well. You're creative in how you're using your own body and how you're improving and perfecting what you can do. Fair, yeah. true enough. And <laughs> just, just so that we state this for the record, science is not opinionative, correct, Dr. Heller? Science is very opinionated. Uh, <laughs> elaborate, Dr. Heller. Elaborate. My opinion does not change science. <laughs> science is very opinionated because uh, there, there, you have to ask what you can really know. Okay? Fair. And what you can really know are hard facts. And that means data. So if you have actually accumulated data and you've measured things honestly, you can believe that. Okay. And that's true. But then what happens is people will interpret it and they'll say, well, we think what this really means is such and such. Now, that's the process of science. That's the creativity part. But you can't take it as truth. It's, it's a hypothesis is a new idea that needs to be tested until you test it with valid methods. Uh, you can't say that you know it, or you know it to be true. So yeah. people differ a lot in how they interpret the same data. What, yeah, what would you say? Viable, essentially. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What would you say as it deals with kind of athletics? Is I get that's what Cool Mitt kind of deals with. Um, what is the most true piece of science that you've noticed amongst athletes? Well, from our experience, the most true piece of science is that temperature influences performance. Uh, and that is easy to measure. 
Do you mean body temperature or external temperature like in the weather? Well, external temperature is going to determine to a certain extent body temperature. Mm -hmm. Because when you are working out, you're producing heat. That heat has to be lost to the environment. And the rate at which you can lose it to the environment depends on the temperature differential. So if you're in a cold environment, you can lose it very fast. If you're in a hot environment, you can't. Yeah, you made sure. part about us talking about how skin was a really good insulator. I asked him a lot of right, um, right. A lot Is of there any way that we can start taking all this generated heat that I produce and I like, keep my house so I can pay less? <laughs> That's, you know, funny. that's funny you say that because we're working on a project now that I can't really talk a whole lot about, but it oh, exists. Dope. It is a thing. That's dope. It's essentially using a heat pump to the heat pump functions, you know, as a um, what was the term I'm looking for? Jeez, I've been nerding out all day doing work. Well, like I, I just bought a cooling mattress. Like, if there was a way that we could take the heat that I produce every single night that the mattress filters out. I mean, obviously, you'd have a big contraption as of right now with a big machine that would probably have to take all that and then turn it into heat. But if you could do something like that, that would be super cool. Well, you're sort of doing it indirectly because if you produce a lot of heat, you can lower your ambient temperature. Yeah. So uh, you're essentially warming yourself. Uh, and yeah, it's becoming a problem at night. Yeah. <laughs> you, you've well, essentially asked the question of thermodynamics. Right. Well, isn't yeah. that the topic of cool mid though? Right. More or less? The cool mid facilitates getting heat from inside the body core to the outside world. Hmm. So what we're doing is cooling from the inside out. So like we, a, have you guys talked about how Mr. Heller got to cool mid? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. Just yeah. catching like, up here, fellas. <laughs> it's like a, a, a supercharger on a car versus a turbo. A supercharger just bleeds heat. It bleeds potential energy that you can use in that system, which is the system is that, you know, that the engine with a turbocharger essentially takes cool air, compresses it, spools it, spits it right into the intake, and it makes it more efficient. That's a turbocharger on a car isn't some magical chemical thing that like, oh, God, my car is going faster. It's just com super compressed air going through. The same way you put a cold air intake on a car, I think it kind of functions the same way. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Heller. I think I'm right. Right. Well, <laughs> The, 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 the thing to realize, Steve, is that um, you, you, you have to protect your muscles from overheating. Yes. Muscles produce a lot of heat. Uh, individual mitochondria can be running at 50 degrees centigrade. Mm -hmm. so that's, very, that's a huge amount of heat. That's hot. <laughs> yeah, and so we live on the edge. We live on the very edge of thermal damage or thermal death. Uh, we regulate our body's temperatures at 37 degrees centigrade, and at 39, you're already impaired. At 40, you're really bordering, going into heat illness and, and, and serious problems. So we live right on the edge, and we have to protect our muscles. And the way we do that is we have a fail-safe mechanism, and that's what you're seeing when you can't do one more rep. You know, when you can't just cannot keep up the pace anymore, uh, mm -hmm. it's your muscles which are shutting down and they're shutting down by not supplying fuel to the fire, not supplying fuel to the mitochondria. And as the temperature comes down, the enzymes reactivate. And once again, you have fuel going into the furnace. And how do you explain anomalies like runners that don't get lactic acid build up, you know, we, we talked about that earlier and, and the David Goggins is of the world. Like they just kind of just keep going like their brains broken. Is their brain broken? Dr. <laughs> no, no, this is not a function. Uh, well, the brain does play a role. So uh, rise in temperature can affect your volition uh, to continue to work, but I'm talking about a fail safe mechanism in the muscle itself. So it can exist in your biceps, but not, affect your legs, okay? Uh, you, you don't have the same temperature throughout your body. If you have a muscle which is working hard, a large dynamic muscle, that muscle is considerably hotter than the rest of your body. So it's that muscle that has to be protected. And that muscle shuts off when it gets into 
uh, a dangerous temperature zone. Jeez, that's what I think that's what happened to me at the in 2014 after my last deployment before I got out of the military. I tried to do a ultra marathon mm. in New Mexico and yeah, I got to mile 36 and I realized that I had I had for lack of a better term, I had fucked up and I was my body was shutting down. I started to pee and I didn't know why I was peeing. And I started to kind of defecate on myself. Like I was like, why am I, why am I pooping? I don't understand. And I got to the check station. They had one like every nine miles or so. I was mm -hmm. about 36 and they were like, uh, you probably should stop. I was like, no, 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 I'm finishing this. And they were like, well, let us at least put an IV on you. And they put an IV in both of my arms and my shoulders. I kept running. I felt good for the next 10 minutes or so. And then once I crossed that finish line, I could not walk for two days. Like I was just sitting there. I could not move my legs. So mm -hmm. I guess that's it, the example of like going too far, like a bridge too far. But, yeah. Uh, so, so one of us is certifiably crazy. I have an issue. The other <laughs> one of us <laughs> does like triathlons every three or four years, maybe. <laughs> okay. So, somebody here is nuts, and it's not me or Doctor Heller. But not anymore. Not 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 anymore though. But what what is your? I know you have a cool mate, but what is your view on like cold baths? Uh, well, uh, cold baths are certainly a good way to get heat out of the body quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have someone, let's say, in the football field who goes down with borderline heat stroke, uh, their core temperature has gotten up to 41, 42 degrees. Oh, sure. A cold bath is a great way to rapidly get that heat out of the body. The problem is you don't always have a cold bath available. <laughs> so They're starting to become more readily available. <laughs> But what do they do? They call an ambulance, right? Mm -hmm. And this is all time critical responses. So once you're, I don't know if you uh, remember the story of Corey Stringer. Uh, he was a Minnesota Vikings uh, player who during practice went down with heat stroke uh, and they took him into the locker room and he was conversing. He actually jogged into the locker room. He was conversing with the trainers. Jesus. And then they put cold towels on him, and then he went unconscious, okay? And they took him to the uh, hospital, and when he got into the hospital, his temperature was 108 Fahrenheit. Oh, he was dead. And he, he died uh, oh, of, 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 of heat stroke, yeah. Uh, so what's the thing to do? So someone has a heat stroke, what, what is it oh, next? So where I'm going with this is that time is critical. And what CoolMit does is CoolMit gives you the opportunity to treat the individual at point of first contact. So sure, you may call an ambulance. Sure, you may get to an ice bath eventually, but you're taking care of the problem immediately. You're extracting heat. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the CLS thing, like having first, like in the army, you do like CLS class and they're like, oh, the, the, the whole joke of, of CLS is just if you have a tourniquet, you can save anybody's life. <laughs> Because like the, the number one thing that happens in, in military is just bleeding out. But yeah. no one ever talks about, oh, if someone's getting really hot, what do you do? And Well, that's because that's when you yell for a medic. Yeah. And the medic shows up and... So what does the medic do? And the standard of care, which you will find in your uh, first aid guides, books, and so forth, mm -hmm. is you take these chemical cold packs and you put them in the axilla, in the mm -hmm. groin, and the neck. Yes. Right? Okay. So what we've shown is that if you take those same cold packs and instead you put them on the palms, the soles, and the face, you improve the cooling by double. I mean, you, you speed up the cooling uh, uh, by, by increase the the cooling by tw by a factor of two. Yeah, yeah. really. That, yeah, that's what I found out when I was doing this. That's, I had just sent you and uh, the other Craig. I can't yeah. remember Craig's last name. It was a twofold increase in my recovery. Yeah, like it was two, yeah. and I was like, "How did this happen?" Because I I ran a regression chart, and I was like, "Okay, what is this?" P, P square value me like the, and I had the confidence level set at ninety five. I probably should have set it like ninety just to be safe, but. I found it was a twofold increase in my recovery and not even accounting for the ambient air temperature, which I have to input today from my, from my log that I kept in my little black notebook here on my desk. But even outside of that variable, 
it still was a twofold increase in recovery because as like I said, as I kept using it, I had to, I was I had to use it l like less time to recover. And it wasn't because the temperature outside is better or the workouts are getting easy because they're all still hell. It's still hard. But that little device that you have could save so many lives in, in just the Army in general because I've been at ranges and at FTXs, field exercises, yep. NTC, where people just go out and we're like, oh, crap, do we have any ice? And funny enough story, last NTC rotation I was at with 1st Brigade at Fort Carson, we ran out of ice. We went black on ice like every day within two hours. And we lost 45% of our brigade to heat casualties. Yeah. Yeah. And it's pretty wild. If we had like even seven of those units in each battalion, mm -hmm. we could have we could have mitigated that really yeah. quickly. Well, he, here's an analogy for you to, to really bring this home. Uh, if your car is overheating and you have a garden hose, would you use the garden hose to spray the tubes going in and out of the radiator or would you use it to spray the radiator? Okay, so, so here and here, these are the tubes going in and out of the radiators. Here are the radiators, right? Mm. So that's why it's much more efficient to cool the blood flowing through these large surface areas rather than try to cool it in the tubes that are going in and out. True. That's interesting. Do you happen to know, is it the same with heat, like when you're too cold? And you're trying to produce warmth. And what about that? So if you reverse this to from yes. uh, heat to cold, if oh, you went yeah. from you're too cold to you want to get warmer, do I warm my hands first and that would yeah. flush yeah. the rest what of the system? What do you do when you come up to a campfire on a cold night? Or right? you put your hands in your armpits when you're in the field. Right. Like it's cold. Now, see, that's where I was about to go. Is, or I put is, them in my, there, my nuts. <laughs> there you go. Right. right. So that's yeah. what I was asking you if it's the same as putting your hands, like trying to warm your hand like to the palm, or if it's more of like, hey, do I, does the radiator then hold the tubes, essentially? <laughs> well, what I told Kenya at the outset was how we discovered these heat exchangers we were using them in reverse. We were using them to heat patients coming out of anesthesia. Oh. Yeah. So it was then we realized that this was a natural mammalian adaptation for losing heat. We were just using them in reverse. Okay. So is, um, is cool mitt, I, I want to say, not promoting to, but is it more uh, becoming a, uh, a product for healthcare, or is it dabbling just in like the realm of athletes for the time being? I I haven't gotten too much on the background there. Yeah, it's not being used in healthcare. Okay. Uh, and the reason is that uh, you have to have FDA approval. Yeah. In order, Which we all know those guys are real order, good. So uh, we will essentially seek that uh, at some point, uh, and we can show all sorts of ways that we can help people um, with exchange. So, for example, uh, individuals with multiple sclerosis are very temperature sensitive. Mm -hmm. and we can essentially extend their ability to function by giving them the cold source, the cool mix. Yep. Uh, so uh, we've had uh, individuals who uh, were unable to leave an air-conditioned space in the summer without causing their symptoms to get worse. Uh, but it would, if they had the ability to palm or cool, uh, they were able to go back out, play golf, go shopping and what have you. That's life changing. Like, yeah. I don't, yeah. how, how many units have you guys made so far? I know I got one of them, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, how'd that, uh huh. Hmm. Uh, other, than, other than God bless Texas, where it's hot as shit. <laughs> I, I really don't know. Um, uh, we'd have to ask uh, our colleagues, Craig Gile and others, where they stand. The, the orders for production have been held up by supply line problems. So how many they have now, I, the last I heard is that they were expecting uh, a, new sh a new lot of 1,000 to come in. Uh, but they have back orders like 10,000. 
so what is what has stopped you guys from getting at this tech to market decision like layman's way of speaking kind of like i guess contractual obligations or is it just because the fda is just slow to approve things no we haven't yet we haven't applied oh yet. okay okay uh, you want to have the, so right now I would say that we're in a stage that I would call beta testing. It's clear we will want to change some design aspects. Um, and uh, therefore, we're, we have more than we can handle with the non-medical applications right now. And this is the low hanging fruit that allows us to perfect a device that we would then want to put through uh, clearance for a 510k approval that is that's amazing that's pretty cool you said you were also doing uh, a study with student athlete travel sleep rhythm like i i have um sleep apnea so i have to wear a cpap at night because oh. i snore like a i snore like a, a, a bear in the winter yeah. and i didn't know it was killing me and you know found out it was killing me got the cpap and my whole life has changed like what is your what is your thought process on sleep or you can you talk about the study that you guys are conducting in the like uh beginning stages well we're, we're not actually doing anything with uh heat and sleep now but certainly as steve had mentioned earlier uh sleep is improved by a cool environment and there's there's a very simple explanation for that <clears throat> that when you go to sleep your brain thermostat is reset to a lower level, okay? So when you go to bed, you may feel cold or chilly and you pull on blankets. Then you go to sleep and your set point goes down and all of a sudden you wake up and you're hot, you're overheated. Yeah. Now, uh, if you're in a cool room, you just have to stick out your hands or your feet and you don't, it's, it's easy. Uh, but if you're in a hot room, you can't do that. So what happens is that the, the, the sleep gets very fragmented and disturbed if you're in a warmer environment and you can't accommodate that drop in your set point. That's pretty, yeah, that's pretty spot on because I got an eight sleep mattress pod cover. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, oh, my God. Did you get the eight sleep mattress? I had the cover to go on my performance sleep mattress and dude, it's a life changer. Like it, and it auto regulates as you yes. hit different levels of sleep. And if, as long as I go to sleep by nine 30, I could wake up at four o'clock in the morning. I'm fully recovered. I could have done the world's worst workouts the day before. And I'm like, Oh, I feel sleep drunk. I feel great. This is amazing. <laughs> yeah, the sleep eight system is quite remarkable. So it's, Dr. Heller, how long have you worked in this this line of science, I guess? But Well, um, um, let's say that uh, I have been teaching physiology to students here at Stanford for 50 years. Jesus. Hang you're on. Tenured, you're he tenured was at Stanford? Why did I not know yeah. this? What do you mean? He's a smart man. I was. <laughs> Why well, people can be smart and not work at Stanford, Ken? He is the smartest person in this room right now, and probably the smartest person I now know. So, aside from the guy that helped create yeah. Excel that I work with, so yeah. Well, it's definitely it wasn't me. So that's not the competition. Here. <laughs> the bar was already. You're in a competition with him already, so not me. <laughs> I said the bar fairly low compared to you two, but go ahead, sir. Yeah. So, yeah, I've been uh, at it for a long time. And then how long have you been with CoolMit? Well, we just started CoolMit, I guess, uh, a year or two ago. Two years, mm -hmm. I guess, now. Uh, two, maybe three. Maybe it's three years. I, I, I don't actually uh, remember. Okay. It's, a, it's, enough, it's enough time. Like, how, why has no one else a, done this? We had an effort before that didn't work out. We, we uh, had started a company. Uh, that produced the first versions of the Palmer cooling technology. And uh, it just never got to the state which it was a good piece of equipment, an ideal piece of equipment. Uh, so we sort of uh, stopped that effort and started over again. Jeez. And who, who jumped on board with you guys uh, or you to get it to the process which it is at now? Uh, it's interesting because... Our efforts started with uh, Department of Defense support. So back at the time of the uh, initial uh, Iraq uh, uh, war, 
uh, there was an effort to speed up the rate at which recruits could be physically conditioned. Uh, and DARPA, which is a division of the Department of Defense, which deals with mm -hmm. new technologies, yep. it, DARPA put out a call uh, for... They're trying to get super soldiers. Yeah, <laughs> super soldiers. It was, it was a program called Maintaining Peak Soldier Performance. And they put out a challenge. You had to show that you could increase physical conditioning by, uh, well, something, 25% or, or, or something. In other words, you could speed up the basic training. So and it could, did it have to be a drug or did it have to be a product? It, had to, it could be anything, okay? Oh. So <laughs> what we, 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 of course, they don't accept everything. They, no, because the cartels probably were donating crack to that. <laughs> like, yeah, this will definitely work. <laughs> Go ahead. So we we far by using uh, polymer cooling and physical conditioning, we dramatically uh, improved the the rate of physical conditioning for these uh, recruits coming in that you know just have not been working very hard their whole lives. You know? uh, so okay, that, now that was the very beginning. Uh, so then several years ago, uh, the man who was our program manager at DARPA, uh, he joined our effort to, uh, to make this into a, a commercially viable product. Jeez. And how much, how much money has been invested in this so far? You know, I really don't know. Ballpark? I, I can't even balance my own checkbook. So I don't I, have a checkbook. I let other people worry about that. It's like Steve lets his wife balance his checkbook. He's like, yeah, you, uh, you. No, no, no. I have my USAA app and that just shows me everything I need to know. And then it even tells me when I should or shouldn't spend money. <laughs> it's like you're right in now, the red already. <laughs> right now, it's, hey, brother, you're doing good. Just don't spend too much. Exactly. But you know, that's not entirely surprising to me that A, the DOD was one of the first people. They're willing to dip their toe into just about everything. Yeah. And I mean just about everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, that, that is a, a welcoming idea, especially with at least basic training wise in, in conjunction with that, maybe not trying to get soldiers to perform or recover faster in basic training. Cause honestly, I think basic training, the best part of it was a, the night sleep that you get is the best night sleep you will ever have in your entire life. The shitty part was waking up and feeling like, okay. That I make the right decision. I'm still and that, here. <laughs> that occurs for 10 weeks straight. <laughs> but when you go to bed, it doesn't matter what the blankets are. It doesn't matter that they're like wiry and it's ridiculous. But the best night's sleep ever. But I, I could like see. Out. Oh, my God. Until you have to wake up for fire guard shifts. But the, the best application I could see, especially with Cool Mitt, is all of the ice sheets that we ever brought out to all the ranges and all the things that you do because privates in basic training will go above and beyond what most people will ever try to do either for the acceptance portion or try to get like a, a drill sergeant to appreciate their hard work, right? Because they don't know the basic training is a, a formality to get through to become a soldier. So they think, Oh, if I do more, if I go harder, if I don't say that my legs hurt or I don't say that something's numb, They'll think that I'm good in the end when I tell everybody that it was shitty. But we had, I, I want to say, a minimum of like three females that went down with like heat exhaustion. And they, you know, they got to strip you down right there on the tarmac or not, not tarmac uh, on the drill mat. And they just pop your uniform right open. They cut down your pants and then they apply all of the ice sheets as fast as possible. But something like with the cool mitt, if they had a practical cool mitt at locations and ranges, like Ken kind of said earlier, that would be extremely well like DOD funding to that project because they could use that everywhere. Yeah. And that, not even to mention here in Texas, it's 105 for yeah. like the last month. Yeah, they had a number of our original versions uh, in Iraq, and uh, they ended up for it. using them frequently for the civilians who were being brought in with heat stress or heat stroke. Uh, oh, I, th I thought you meant like DOD civilians and I was gonna be like, oh no, they're just playing with it, sir. They're not, they're not actually hurting. They're just in there complaining. 
But we've, we've had a number of cases of athletes who on the field have gone down uh, mm -hmm. with borderline heat stroke and they call the ambulance, but they used the, the Palmer cooling right away. And by the time the ambulance got there, they were up and walking around. See, I feel like that the applications that this has at like an NFL team, a soccer team, yeah. right? Yeah. I don't know. I couldn't like if you can buy the yeah. ice baths that the teams buy now, they're buying the polar plunge, like tubs and all that extra stuff. If you could have a system like it's basically hand carryable, right, Ken? I'm yeah, you can just yeah. pick it up and do what you need to do. If you just had a uh, a physical therapy or not physical therapy tech, what is it? Um, like the performance therapy techs that are on the sidelines and shit. Yeah. Are those physical therapists essentially? PTs. Trainers, just trainers. Yeah. yeah. Have one of those guys. One of my buddies, Ronnie. He's uh he did an internship with the Raiders, and he was there's you know probably a couple instances during preseason and summer camp that he probably had that issue. And I mean, if you just run from the sidelines, grab it, put it on a player's hand, and just be like, "All right, everybody, stand back." Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, um, uh, sir, you probably haven't seen Blue Mountain State, but Ken, you probably know what I'm talking yeah, about. What you're talking about. <laughs> in in this show, they it followed a college football team, and a bunch of the guys, uh, they were at practice one day, and they they one guy gets heat exhaustion, but they put a rod that's ice, figuratively, like up the anus of a player to immediately drop their, their core temperature. So the rest of the team, for whatever reason, I guess here's, this is some magical thing. And they all strive to get heat exhaustion at practice. And it, it gets a bit ridiculous, but I can imagine the practicality of it. So you're saying this to a doctor. <laughs> hey, he's on our show, man. It's like, yeah. But yeah, you went. On, I know you went on Huberman Lab and talked to them. Was that was that you, Doctor Heller? Or yeah, was that, that was you. Yeah. yeah, that I listened to that one, and I was like, man, I gotta ask more questions like they are. But I'm like, I'm not that well versed in the human body. I just know how to write things for you to do to get stronger, and I know the simple right. steps to recover. Well, here's I'm not that podcast. A very simple thing is extend your work volume, and by using Cool Mitt, you greatly extend your work volume. I've had freshman women, freshman women, not athletes, doing over 800 push-ups. Jesus. And how long? Flip it on. About 45 minutes. Ten sets with three-minute rests with cooling. So they came in one day and they said, Dr. Heller, you cost us a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. We had a formal dance this weekend. We all had to buy new sleeveless dresses. Because they got jacked real quick. <laughs> That's amazing. Mm. No, how, how, you don't even, I don't think, do you know how much it costs to build one unit? Uh, no, I don't. No, you don't. Uh, okay. I, I would imagine, you see, that changes with volume. Uh, because uh, when you uh, are able to order things in very large numbers, you get reduced prices. So, Right now, it probably costs several hundred dollars, but I think that'll come way, 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 way down soon. Uh, and that that's, I mean, that's kind of the cost of doing business, I guess. And, and I, 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 I think that we should, what we aim for is the price of a good pair of running shoes. That's amazing. Or a good, I, or a good tennis racket, you know? I saw how much it was when I opened the box. I saw the invoice and I was like, oh, Jesus. Okay. What was it? Oh, you want to know? Yeah. It's like 1600 bucks, man. <laughs> okay, well, that, that's going to come way, way, way oh, down. Oh, yeah. yes, it should come way down. And then I sat back and I thought about, because I, you know how the DOD reached out, you know, or you guys reached out to DOD with, via a funding opportunity announcement more than likely, and you answered that call and you gave them your proposal. You went through all of this, you know, selection stuff, and you negotiated how much they were going to give you to do this study. Um I mean, I go through the same thing each day, and, and we realize that at the end of the day, when they submit their tech-to-market plan, their m and plan, and they go, okay, in two years as this project is completed, we can produce these retrofits for these buildings at X dollars. And we go, okay, that's a way better number than what you had in the beginning, because the beginning, like a retrofit heat pump for a home in, um, a home in Alaska is about $20,000 when it's a prototype. 
But mm -hmm. once they get a huge volume and people with the demand for it goes up, that twenty thousand dollar heat pump unit right. goes down to three thousand dollars, and that's affordable for you know most people. And you know, attack on the government subsidies that will go along with that. They'll, the government basically pays for the whole thing for whomever wants it. So, yeah, yeah. you know, that that is a that is what I'm hoping to see from you guys. I really do hope that it grows. And one thing I can tell you is your Instagram page. Who do I talk to about your Instagram page? You need to post more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't use social media, so I'm not familiar with it. That is, I'm going to show it to you real quick. I have this nifty way of screen sharing. Look at this gentleman. If that's it, it's bare. Yeah. <laughs> if, that's if, not much. Yeah. And I know that when it, when it comes to how to like market these things and uh -huh. push the, 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 the envelope of, of kind of awareness in the community, everyone needs to know about this because they need to be advocates for recovering, cooling, yeah. eat, just yeah. not even from the aspect of, of the athletes being better performers, just the life-saving technology. And that's in that right. statement that I wrote for you guys earlier, based mm -hmm. on what I realized from it. As I, I remember doing a running workout. I got to 186 beats a minute. I walked in the garage and I had already turned the cool mitt on and I put it on and I laid there on the ground with my stomach up to the to the sky in my garage and in a minute and 22 seconds i dropped down to 120 uh beats a minute and i was like that's exactly what craig gal said would happen and that happened <laughs> it's like yeah. this magic device that solves a lot of problems <laughs> but well, yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad it works for you and uh i thank you for your support because i think as you said many many people will benefit from uh from this uh, one of the problem you asked about uh, money, uh, one of the interesting things that everybody recognizes with uh, DOD uh, projects is it's called the Valley of Death. So the DOD puts <laughs> lots of money uh, into new technology, but then once the technology is proven, then that's eh, up to you. You got to go fund it. <laughs> so that's when you have to find investors and people who are willing to make a chance. You don't have to tell us about the DOD living oh, you high and dry. <laughs> yeah, they give you your walking papers. They're like, peace, better go talk to the VA dude. But give you a dollar and they're going to take 99 cents back and tell you to get lost. As far as like that, that when they, I don't know how it works for the different department entities, but I know for the Department of Energy, when that happens, we advocate for these institutions or private entities yeah. to have cost share partners. Yeah. These people invest their money into it. So at the yeah. end of the day, yeah. when that patent comes out, they can easily like put that tech to market very quickly. Yeah. You know, they can they yeah. have a manufacturing line to do this. You know, they have all the research papers that back right. it. They have the manuscripts and they just start producing the thing. And that's yeah. at the end of the day, it's all about helping people. And a lot of people look at the DOD or DOE, these department, these government entities and go, oh, they're just out for themselves when I'll actually have the people that form these organizations mm -hmm. really seek to do a lot of good. Cause I know for me, myself, I manage a bunch of projects that are going to help a lot of people and especially schools. Like right. we have this right. huge, yeah, this huge, almost $50 million schools funding opportunity announcement that's coming out later this year uh, after the turn of the new fiscal year. And we're just trying to give money. We're just pushing it out. Like mm -hmm. just, Whoever wants to come up with these novel ideas and make these things, the classrooms more comfortable so people can learn, we're going to produce smarter people. And that's the issue. <laughs> you know, I, I say along those lines that every single uh, high school in this country should have a cool mitt device because uh, when athletes and football players, basketball, they start practicing in the late summer, early fall, many places in the country, uh, there are people going, there are kids going down with heat stroke. And, you know, every single school you'll find defibrillators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's much more common for a, a student athlete to go down with heat stroke than to have <laughs> atrial fibrillation. Yeah, going to AFib, yeah. Yeah, true. How do we do that? Like, how do you, how do you, I, I don't know if you have the answer to this problem, but how do we get, how do we put the word out to these schools to contact you guys? Is that something you're capable of doing now or, or no, or uh, probably we need to be able to ramp up the production uh, capabilities. And, and that means guaranteeing the supply lines. Uh, so that, that I think uh, is going, because you don't want to promise things before you can deliver. Yeah. So right now we're working very, very hard uh, to uh, get product out to people who are the early adopters who really want to use it now. 
And uh, this is the process of building up the production line, building up the production capabilities. Um, and I think uh, very soon uh, we'll be in a position where we have to try to influence the policy makers who are concerned about the safety of uh, kids in school and student athletes in particular. Well, let me know, because I have an in with the Department of Education and Department of Energy, and I know how much money Great. they will spend. So let me know, and I will con I'm like, if I say it, so it's, there's a. My wife's a teacher, so I have an in with the director of the school. <laughs> I'm, I'm five people away from the vice president, essentially. That's where I'm at. I'm five people away from the vice president. So, like, okay. if, if you're trying to get things pushed out or get an initiative or you have a white paper that seems like – if you have a white paper on cool mitt please send it to me and i will send it to anyone and everyone in the department of education okay get, get them are we talking about the vice president or the vice president yeah, of like, kamala, kamala harris yeah oh, like geez. five people away yeah. <laughs> we need, let's get her on let me hear what she has to say about gosh that. she'd never talk to us what were you saying craig <laughs> no i will call I'll, i will uh, take up your offer and uh, get materials to you Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. Okay. Do you have anything else, Steve? I don't want to hold him longer than an hour because he's a busy man. Oh, he's no. Got... Let's, let's not hold him longer than an hour. Um, the Stanford, Stanford guys, you guys must be busy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> us, us lonely army guys, you know. I'm ready to go eat dinner here in a minute, but we'll we'll wrap this up with you, Ken. Me and you will stay on. We'll uh, we'll talk to the people for a second. And then this was a great conversation. I'm, I'm sorry I missed the time frame. Somebody emailed me at 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, <laughs> and I was at Target getting a whole bunch of goodies. So. And Craig said, hey, can we push to five? And I was like, CC everybody. Yes, let's push to five. Well, <laughs> I, in, in answer to one of your comments, Steve, uh, we can say that Stanford makes good use of cool net. <laughs> God damn right, man. Good. To go Good to for Stanford. Stanford. Any chance we can get honorary degrees, Ken, from Stanford? Oh God, no! I'm not, bro. I don't want. I don't want to go back. It's an honorary degree. Uh, I don't actually have to do anything. Nah, dog. I don't want to put that on my resume. I don't. I'll like, hang that so... proudly on my wall. No, they're gonna look at me and go, "Are you a special guy?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm a special guy." Sure. <laughs> We're very special men. But thanks a lot no, for thank coming thank on you. and doing this. You have yourself a great night. Thanks. Thanks, thank you. Bye bye. Right, bye bye. Oh, go. God damn. He, yeah. he had somebody in the room doing all the tech for him because he definitely doesn't do that. Oh, 100%. No, he was in here early. He was in here for like 20 minutes before. <laughs> I felt so bad. Yeah, we Holy talked about before we started recording. Shit. Yeah, he said balance checkbook. Bro, that's where he's at. He don't yeah, use he, computers for shit. He probably still has a flip phone, if I had to imagine. Probably, and that's probably the way to go because I sent him a data set, and I, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll show you that. Do I have it up here somewhere? I got it on one of these screens, the data set that I made. Where is it at? Oh, there it is. I'll pull it over here. Yeah, it's a large. Nope, wrong. Wrong share button. Bam, 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 bam. There you go. Yeah. It was like so. Seven. Go ahead, explain this to me real quick. So is so each one of these days is an observation, right? And it has mm -hmm. my workout on here. This one, it's a, it's a rest, rest. Let me put rest in here. Um, and I have an observation of a date. Each one is an observation, of course. This is the workout. Like I wrote all the workouts in here as they occurred. Yep. And every morning I got up. That's spelled wrong. Every morning I got up and I took my temperature with a thermometer mm -hmm. and I wrote, I wrote it down, recorded it. I checked my resting heart rate that morning when I woke up, that's what it was. Before I worked out, I took my temperature again. That was my, or my, I took my, um, I said resting heart rate. Uh, that's wrong. Uh, yeah. So I took my body temperature before and I went my heart rate during and then time of recovery. When I use a cool mitt, my recovery heart rate is the same all the way through. I'm missing a line in here that is my heart rate before I started working out, but that's not okay. That doesn't really matter. It's it's no. this but whatever. But that time that it took me to recover from everything, if you look at these numbers, they get lower and lower every time. They just get lower and lower as I go down. 
and it the time that I needed to use the cool mitt went down drastically, like a lot. So I had a twofold increase in my recovery. So it's it started at like a minute twenty six. Now it's down to like a minute twenty, a minute twelve, a minute one. Hmm. And it's as you use it, the more and more you use it, the better and better it gets. Mm-hmm. The, the, lo- the less time you have to use that specific device mm-hmm. but yeah dude the thing's pretty awesome it it took a lot of writing and a lot of God probing <laughs> well man did you end up uh what you call it did you get all that stuff from gooder oh shoot oh me in the broadcast no 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 don't do that don't do that oh, we haven't get... done an ad read yet what stuff from oh i put them in there i just i recorded one and i just stab i stab slap them in there Oh shit! Really? Yeah, yeah. I just insert them. Don't worry about it. I snip all that shit in. Oh well, you know. Hey, sometimes I like to ad read, man, because <laughs> I you're taking. I told you to record job. yourself, and you did not record yourself. This is fair. And I sent you all the things to read. All you do is send me the video file, put it in the Google Drive. I'm a oh, dick. Is that, is that yeah. all? You want a yeah. video or you want audio? No, just audio. Just record yourself doing that whole ad read thing. Ad lib, oh, okay. do what you want to do. I sent you that email, Steve. God damn it. Yeah, but also ad-libbing while I'm staring at a wall is a little different than ad-libbing on here. Oh, go ahead and ad-lib now. Knock, knock it out. Uh-huh. Put you on the spot, didn't I? Well, now I don't want to because you told me you already <laughs> – you're telling me that you already threw them in there, so now I don't want to. Steve's got stage fright and his wife's behind no, him. Apparently, he doesn't have enough stage fright because, you know, there's a baby in that lady. Oh, right. He's going to be blowing it like a puppy. Okay. What are you eating? Pasta. Okay, oh, that's what I'm probably gonna make tonight. It's simple. Well, so we got um, we got ground wagyu beef from Walmart or Target. Uh, HEB. Oh God, that sounds what? delicious. I want to do that. It was like barely cheaper. I think it was like twelve dollars for like a one pound. Oh, that's not nearly enough food for me. Well, I mean, no shit, it's barely for me. But we're putting <laughs> it in with uh vodka sauce and peas. And then we're making pasta on the side, so yeah. Well, damn. Hey, it's, Jess. She said it's see her feeding you. No, no. It's pasta, bitch. <laughs> I'm gonna clip that. I'm gonna clip it. I'm gonna clip it. <laughs> that's, fucking, that's how you become a fat boy, Steve. That's fucking delicious, dude. Be a fat boy. Be nice. That is so good. I figured. Um. <coughs> oh shit! It's got a kick at the end. Yeah, we got to put that LLC together. Uh, yes. So for everybody who's listening and a loyal listener, I don't know how many of those that we have. Um, this will essentially become a company at some point. Ken and I are starting to develop the inner workings of that because especially with getting sponsorships, you actually have to get paid through uh, certain um, business realms. So that way taxes, things like that come in now and Ken and I aren't spending our own money left and right. Yeah, Uncle Sam wants his piece of the pie, man. He can't fucking have it. Too late. We got a W-9 dog. Already filled it out. (laughs) What the fuck, man? Yeah, I filled out the W-9. We just got to make the LLC. (laughs) Uncle Sam. You know what? I I have this weird theory that I think Uncle Sam is actually just a piece of shit. He's back (laughs) on a lawn chair. And I think that iced tea that he's been sipping since fucking like Vietnam and shit. I'm pretty sure that that's like some hard liquor and somebody just put ice cubes in it and thought it was something else. Jesus so, Christ. Every time they're talking, Uncle Sam could just kick back and relax. Uncle Sam is a dirtbag who's already kicked back and relaxed, and I think he's fucking homeless. You think he's – no, he's got a home. It's the White yep. House, and he's in the basement just kicking back, just doing his fucking thing, man. Oh, my God. Yeah, he's just doing his thing. Yeah, I'll be right out. Yeah. Well, so we have some stuff in the work. Um, I talked to, I sent Rich a DM. Uh, so we will hopefully get something back from that. If not, I also sent, uh, I talked to Charlie today from BCS Classic. My hope is that if I can't get a hold of Rich prior to, uh, I asked him if he could set me up with like a little, not necessarily meet and greet, but like, hey, off on the side after like uh, the introduction to the competition and whatnot, we can just kind of do a, oh, hey, Rich, this is Steve, Steve Rich, kind of nice oh, thing. And hopefully I can nice get some talk to him. He's a nice well, person, I'm, man. I'm sure he's a terrific guy. Um, and I would do my absolute best to maintain my composure. <laughs> and not hug him. <laughs> like, oh, my God, Jesus, God. Rich, I swear to God. <laughs> 
you fucking I'm baby. definitely not wearing a Mayhem shirt that day, for sure. I'm glad you didn't come to the games then, because if you were to walk back there and saw all those people, you'd be like, oh. Fuck. There's so many probably people. There's probably so many. He probably ballpark on apparel alone made it well over 200K. Dude, he's shorter than you. He's so much. He's such a. He's not really? a big human being. Yeah, he's like either I'm a big dude, or he's. You just... are a big dude. You keep telling me you're not, but you're like six something, probably six one, probably leaning six one, right? Five eleven. Like, fuck off with that shit. You were taller than me by three inches, <laughs> and I am five ten. Dude, it's so like probably six one. But you see those people, it's a body type. Like, they like to say CrossFit doesn't fit a body type. Dude, it yeah. 100% fits a body type. Yeah, I mean, like... There's also, like, uh, when I saw when I saw Tia Claire Toomey at Rogue Invitational, she seemed about the same height I thought she was. Oh, yeah. About she five looks eight. like, you think. Yeah. But then also, like, Guy and some of those other guys, they seem about the same, like, 5'10", five, 5'11", five, like, normal nope. size dudes. Nope. Nope. He's not. What is he? It's like 5'8". Five, Five seven. No around, dude. fucking dude. way. Short, short guy. Not even. These cameras don't add ten pounds. They add fucking three inches. They add inches because I was standing next to some of those people, like Carrie Pierce, midget. Um, Danny Spiegel. Wait, don't is, fucking bring up Carrie Pierce. I don't want to talk about that dude. one. That person. Dude, all of these people. Brooke Danny Wells, Spiegel, how? Tiny. Oh she well, looks of course. Big, but she's tiny. Yeah, well, Danny Spiegel is short. Really. I would have figured that she was a little taller. She's like five four, five five, maybe. Really? Yeah, That's... maybe. So she's like a compact. Yeah, she is strong as fuck, though. Well, it's... yeah, I understand. That's why I called her a compact. <laughs> I mean, they don't make small trucks. I mean, she's not a Ford Ranger. <laughs> Ford Rangers aren't. They're not strong. True, but yeah, but they. I mean, you they're could all... put a V six in a compact, and it could go far. What I did was. I would see somebody walking by and I'd be like, oh, hi, you know, I'm Ken. Nice to meet you. And they're like, oh, nice to meet you, too. I'm like, you keep doing what you're doing. It's awesome. I'm not going to ask you for a picture because you're working. And they were like, oh, my God, really? I'm like, yeah, dude, like, do your thing. If I catch you afterwards, I do. If I don't. Yeah. It's cool. I mean, so Rich is going to compete from what Charlie told me. Uh, all, all from what Charlie told me. Uh, yeah, it's going to be in my division. So at some point, maybe, you know what, maybe when I'm running on this third event or fourth event i'll just whisper in his ear like hey old man get the fuck out of the way and he is gonna look at you and beat the <laughs> shit he is going to beat you worse like he's going to do far better than what you like he's he's, oh he's like God. i was just pushing to 60 percent. now i'm gonna push to 90 and just bury him i am completely joking but it's definitely if i run past rich at any point it's going to cross my mind you should have your phone with you so if you pass him you just do i pass <laughs> rich froning and you just cut it off <laughs> The context is, is I'm three laps behind. <laughs> He's actually passing you, but you reversed the camera. You put no, it in I, reverse. I thought it'd be cool if I got to hang out uh, even for like five minutes and just get to say hi to him. And then obviously at that point I can drop the dime of like, hey, like we talked to a couple of you guys. We'd love to have you on. You're a great dude. See you later. Like I know you. He's. I don't know how many of the Mayhem crew are going down there just because they've traveled so much now. And I know a bunch of their kids are back in school. Um. So hopefully it's just like a light thing for him where he's just kind of like, hey, I'm here, I'm there, I'm going to restaurants, whatever. Um, but I, I believe he's partnering with a girl who uh, who she's having the position, I think, donated to her um, because um, wh whomever is really paying a lot of money knows her and knows her family situation right now. So, But from what I also hear, it's a former games teen athlete. What's her name? I don't fucking know. They haven't released her name? Uh, unless Charlie said it in the last episode, which I don't think I caught. Um, it's it's interesting, but... Well, they're going to win, so... <laughs> they're going to win, so... It's cool. I, Liz said that to me yesterday. She was just kind of like... Or no, maybe it was this morning. She was like, remember when we questioned why it's 19 teams and the male-female? It's because they're saving the 20th for him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're like, ah, Rich is going to... I was like, oh, thank God. So I'm I'm just wondering whether or not when we get there... If there's going to be a lot of people because there weren't judges in the qualifier and you didn't have to submit videos. I want to know how many of these people are who they say they are, numbers-wise. Which, again, there's no prize purse. I think there are trophies. I think there are some small giveaways and stuff like that. But there's nothing like – nobody's making five grand off of this. By oh, way. okay. Then it's right? just like for fun. And from what I would expect, Rich and his teammate, if they win – 
I don't know that Rich is going to stand on a podium in front of a bunch of people. I would say he'd probably be like, hey, like you and I, we're going to come over here, let them like move the next team up or some shit. Right. Yeah. So the main attraction, I believe, is raising money in Rich Roning. What is it? Were they raising money for? He said, "I didn't know." Uh, the Ronald McDonald Foundation. Okay, yeah, they yeah they don't they dump like, all that money in there. Yeah. I mean, I think they on their website. I think it said somewhere over like forty thousand dollars has been raised, or seventy five thousand dollars in the last three years, and I think somewhere around thirty to forty per year is what they're averaging. That's pretty good. That's that's so, something. It's making I mean, a difference. I mean, it is. Yeah, and I from what I think I saw on the website too is there's three thousand plus spectators, so it's like it's drawing a crowd. Oh yeah, it's gonna get bigger every year. As long as, as long as they're doing a good thing for people, and they're partnering they're with, people. they're partnering with the fittest experience mm-hmm. that also goes on down here. Because I guess Charlie and that guy who run that are good. Rogue Invi- or not Rogue Invitational. Rogue the company is providing all of the equipment except for the rig. Oh okay, yeah. Because they probably already got a rig in there. Uh, so I guess they're taking the one from the fittest experience and they're delivering it over. Um, but, uh, from what I know, all the barbells, all the weights, I would assume this is all stuff from the games, possibly, gonna, probably that they just either garage sale afterwards. Maybe. I don't know. You should That'd get, well, I mean, you don't have a reason to get weights, but yeah, I no. bought, I mean, I bought weights at a pittance. It was crazy. How cheap I mean, I would definitely, if they do garage sale wise, that, that weight's probably going to be like at least a hundred dollars off and our gym owner. And a bunch of the gym athletes are going to be there to cheer on. We're sending eight teams. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, Jesus. And that's in scaled intermediate and RX. I think we have three RX teams, two intermediates. And then I think like, what is that? Four, four, yeah. three uh, scaled teams. So if she comes up, I would assume if they're doing a garage sale, she'll probably look to buy some stuff. And then at that point, like if all these gym members are there, I'd just be like, hey, everybody willing to throw in 50, 100 bucks, and we'll get more weights, we'll get more nice things. Yeah, it, I think I got a stack. I got 55s, two sets of each 55, 45, 35, 25, and change place for $1,000. Oh, that's not terrible. It wasn't bad at all because no. on the site, Rogue site, fucking a set of 55s is $450, $500 yeah, fuck that. per plate. But yeah, man, so I would say before we get out of here, um, I want to say at least a thank you to my training partner, Liz. She's been awesome. We are very excited to go do this. Uh, very excited to compete, even though I know it's not necessary for money or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Liz. Thank you to um, her certain somebody. I'm not going to say her name just because I don't know if she really wants that said, but her certain somebody <laughs> has also been very instrumental in like, Coaching us, giving us extra workouts, pushing us because she is uh, a former games athlete or former regionals athlete, I believe. Um, and then she's working with another team out here who hopefully, you know, she'll get her shot to go to like the big time um, relatively soon. I don't know how much of that needs to be let out, but yeah, she's, if she's dedicated to it, it'll show. The results she, well, show. she's she is she's good. She's real good. Yeah. She's, she's she's very good to go and pair on a team. And like this year with the our gym's team, which was good. And they went to the physical experience and they placed well well ish. Um if she was plugged in to a games team, you wouldn't know the difference. So like oh. she was a she was a key piece in our gym's team, but if you took her and you put her on like Rich's team. You yeah. wouldn't necessarily know the difference. Damn. So uh, that Damn. certain somebody, thank you for all your help. If she does get to hear that, the rest yeah. of all that stuff, I'll leave for her to say someday. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody that listens because yeah. without people listening, which is clearly it's just currently zero on the live feed. Oh, that's just live. When it, when it gets uploaded, the people start like dumping and they're going, I wonder what they said today. Thanks yeah. guys. And, and I like do, that about like the YouTube it, algorithm. Yeah. If you do like it, share it, share it with yeah. somebody. Please cause... go on YouTube, write a comment. Then yeah. you go to iTunes, rate the show a five star, leave a comment, Spotify, go over to Spotify, follow. follow, rate the show, leave a comment. Yeah. Helps us with everything analytics wise and at some point the next company that we probably partner with 
um, that's going to be uh, a, a big turning point for us is how we kind of sell ourselves. And then we can have them buy ad space from us based off of how many people we can show we're listening, which also there's another thing I'll talk to you about it offline, but there's a, there's an opportunity, I guess, more or less for a local uh, promotion for us, but then, you know, it might help me out a little bit, but <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Uh, but for, for Ken Clark and Steve Holt, this has been, it's not all black and white. Peace.